Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Let me take this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Let me get this out. Uh. So um, thank you very much for being very patient and waiting until the very end. Um, I want to um, say I'm very honored to be here. And it's, uh, it's just been great. We've had a wonderful time. You've probably all seen uh, uh, my baby hanging around here. And he's had a great time, too. Uh, um, may, uh, he may never have as many uh, beautiful people playing with him uh, eight hours a day ever again in his life. Um, so um, what I wanted to... Um, uh, so the talk that I'm uh, about to give is one that when I proposed it, I proposed it to kind of push myself to try and think about new things. So, uh, and push myself to uh, uh, try to talk about some of the ideas that I've been thinking about for a while and to try to pr put them in words that uh, made sense. So I'm telling you this because um, not everything may make sense. And I'm doing, um, and uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to have this as kind of the start of a conversation about some of these ideas and to get some of these ideas out there so we could ha start having this conversation in the interaction design community. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about really, very broadly speaking, is uh, about how uh, uh, really cheap processing and, wi uh, and widespread networking are changing kind of everything uh, about our world right now, from our relationships to everyday objects, down to actually the shapes of objects, and how the shapes of objects are being uh, uh, affected by uh, their connection to the network. So uh, as, I, as I told you, in 1994, I uh, started as a, apparently one of the first professional web designers anywhere. Um, this was one of the first designs I did. Actually, 1993, I started in 1994. I did, uh, I did this. It was a uh, navigation. You can, you can actually see kind of some of the navigation elements for a hot sauce website back when uh, the image tag was actually less than a year old. Um, so we were kind of new at this. Um, what I'm most proud of with that design is that 16 years later, I don't know if you can see in the upper right, uh, right hand corner on archive.org, 16 years later, they were, this was last year, they were still using that visual identity. <laughs> the oldest pixels on the internet. Um, so in 1997, I, uh, I then moved to uh, Wired and Wired Digital. I happened to have the, uh, uh, I, I happened to be lucky enough to be uh, there when essentially search engines were invented and uh, I was the interaction designer on uh, one of the first ones called Hotbot. Uh, if you look at uh, what this looks like, you can probably tell why Google decided to go with only one form element for theirs. <laughs> so, um, then I left there, and in 2001, I started a, um, I co-founded a, a design and consulting company called Adaptive Path, which is still around. This is the one success story in my uh, company founding history. Um, the uh, <laughs> the thing is, is that I left that company three years later. Um, <laughs> In 2003, uh, while I was starting Adaptive Path and I was sitting out the dot-com crash, I wrote this book called Observing the User Experience. Uh, it um, essentially documents the kind of work that I was doing as a, as a user researcher. And this was kind of my way of, of hiding from the dot-com crash. Um, you know, some of you may have heard of it. I think it's actually pretty good. There's a new version coming out next year. Um, then in 2006, I decided to leave the web behind completely because I uh, had been on the web at this point for 13 years and I was tired of it. And I wanted to see what it was like to do something else other than moving pixels around on a screen. So I started a company called Thingum with Todd Kurt. Um, like many startups, we actually didn't know what we were going to be at first. And so we tried a number of different things, but what we ended up being is we ended up being an electronics manufacturer which is kind of a funny thing. It's a, we're a micro OEM, which means that we are a three-person company, of which only one of which is a full-time um, staff person. We manufacture electronics uh, for um, the experimentation with RGB lighting. It's used uh, by architects and industrial designers all over the world. Um, 
we also took this opportunity to do a, a lot of experimentation with uh, uh, lighting and other technologies. The thing on your right is a uh, RFID wine rack that we did that got some um, uh, notice that we did uh, the whole design and uh, technology for. That was a lot of fun. Um, so uh, then um, because uh, startups don't make uh, that much money, um, I spent some time that's funny. That's missing an image, but okay, that's fine. Um, because startups uh, don't make uh, uh, that much money, I continually have been consulting uh, basically the entire time, um, often for companies that are doing hardware stuff. So there's a, you know, a Yamaha thing, there's a Whirlpool product that's uh, mysteriously missing, and then there's a, uh, a Qualcomm product that I have uh, worked on the UX design of. Um, uh, simultaneously, uh, I've uh, kind of continued to work as a user experience director. Uh, so this is the uh, project I did for uh, credit.com. Um, that was a lot of fun also. Uh, the last couple of years I have spent um, uh, working with uh, customers um, that are largely consumer electronics companies I can't tell you the names of. <laughs> and uh, working on projects I can't tell you about. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, and so this is based on the, uh, my second book, which came out last year, which is called Smart Things. I think they just raffled off one. Um, this, is, uh, this book was my attempt at uh, distilling uh, what I had learned from Thingam uh, uh, in terms of user experience design and also from some of my uh, consumer electronics uh, customers in terms of what I could talk about uh, um, into uh, a set of ideas. And um, that's actually um, a lot of this talk is based on this book. So um, let me start by talking about this. So uh, three days ago, four days ago, I think, maybe, maybe more, uh, uh, it's been within the last week, um, Berg London, which is a uh, London design consultancy, some of you may have heard of, released this. Uh, it is called Little Printer. And it is a product that they are going to be shipping next year. And uh, it's, um, it's a little printer. And uh, uh, it doesn't connect to a specific device. It, um, instead, what it does is it connects to the cloud to print things, not specific things you want to print, but to print things uh, from your Twitter stream, from Foursquare, from the Guardian newspapers, from uh, a wide variety of sources. The um, goal is to give you kind of a peripheral idea of what is happening in this kind of semi-permanent medium. And if you look at the bottom, what they say is, um, they say that uh, they described us more as a family member than a tool. So here's an electronic device that's being described as a family member. Um, so what does that mean? Do I, you know, is this a joke? Are they going to actually do this? No, it's not a joke. They're actually going to do this. And it's a serious thing. So what I wanted to do is look at what objects like this mean in terms of our current ele uh, consumer electronics climate and what they mean in, t in terms of for us as interaction designers. Because um, I really respect Berg as an inter interaction designers. They're really good. They really do really interesting work. And um, what I want to do is I want to really explore the, fo uh, the kind of underlying forces kind of coming together to create objects like this and to kind of think about, okay, what is, what is the environment, what is the world is, uh, where objects like this make more sense than they do today going to look, at, uh, look like? So... Uh, what I want to do is I actually want to oh, go pull back and I want to start by talking about unboxing. Um, do you remember unboxing? Have you ever, ha, how many of you have ever like followed along with an unboxing video or an unboxing photo stream? Like, okay, a handful. So unboxing is this very interesting activity that people do. So um, you know, here's an intentionally old one. I picked one from 2007. So unboxing um, is essentially the documentation of someone's intimate experience of savoring the first time they get to physically touch a digital object, you know, to own this precious device that, they, that, uh, that, uh, that they've gotten. You know, you get this kind of vicarious thrill, like looking through a hole in the wall at them uh, uh, touching their device for the first time. It's a very interesting uh, kind of experience that people have uh, uh, with it. You know, it's a kind of a devotional act. It's this kind of uh, worship 
of this physical object, of the physical form of a digital object. Because unboxing doesn't, I mean, doesn't really happen with things that aren't digital. So um, what's interesting to me is that we've grown up with this world where physicality matters. The, the shape of things, the, the way they feel, how, how much they weigh, you know, whether they're cold or hot or soft or not, matters. And um, what's interesting is that five years ago, phones reached this peak of those kinds of qualities being really important and mattering and being really the, this thing that was a, a key part of what made, uh, made the phone important. You know, essentially, we were at the peak about five years ago of phone form factor experimentation. You know, I don't know if you, if you remember, this is a Nokia phone on the left that's designed to kind of look like a lipstick thing. And that's a uh, Philips phone on the right that's designed to look like a prop from a 1970s science fiction film. I'm not kidding. <laughs> They had a whole line uh, of those. They, they weren't very successful, but they were awesome. Um, it's, a, it's called the Celebri line. So really, like, what they were really doing is they were trying to say, okay, you know, the physical form of these devices matter. The shape of these devices matter. We, we all know what a phone is now. Of course, now phones have changed, and that's what I'm going to talk about in a minute. But now we know what a phone is. Let's look at what, uh, 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 what, what the, uh, the shape means. If we look at today, something happened in those five years. So if you look at unboxing, this, so these are recent unboxing things. So I, I went to Flickr and I looked up uh, uh, unboxing to look at some recent stuff. When we looked at unboxing uh, images for the latest products, um, we see that they all look, basically look the same. They're all essentially black rectangles in a box, right? You know, you, they're in different sizes, you know. One of them's bigger, one of them's smaller. They're slightly different shapes. Um, and yeah, sure, every Android manufacturer has their own skin, but really they're all the same. So what happened? You know, what happened to, to take this world of these crazy phones and, um, from five years ago and move us to this world of re black rectangles? What happened is, is that um, our objects, the things that we have, have actually become less important than the services that they represent. And this is a really deep shift in value you know, it's a shift in value from physical objects to network services. Um, and it means that many of the physical things that, we are take, that we've taken for granted, many of the physical things in our environment, you know, things like furniture, for example, or buildings, are really rapidly changing. And that new, completely different things, like little printer, are being created as our relationship with these things changes. So let me step back a little bit. I like uh, to look at the history of technology as a, a kind of a way to think about uh, where technology is going today. So um, if you've ever used a wind-up record player, you know, like a Victrola, or a uh, treadle sewing machine, that's the pedal kind of sewing machine, you actually kind of, it's kind of a wonderful experience because you have this, this feeling like, holy cow, this thing is doing this fairly complex thing. Like when the sound comes out of a Victrola and it's loud and there's no electricity, it's magical. It's this, re uh, it's this really deep kind of ma uh, magic. And what that magic is uh, saying is that magic is pointing out how used to elect electrical devices we are. That magic is in mechanical devices points out to us how dependent we have become in the functionality of electrical devices and how we have forgotten what it was like not to have electricity. So um, that feeling of, holy cow, there, this was an entirely different world. The world of the wind-up thing was such a completely different world from our world. Is exactly the kind of feeling that our kids, like my little baby up there, um, are going to have about objects that aren't connected to the network. They're gonna say, in the same way that we're like, wow, how does the sound come out of this thing without electricity? They're gonna say, wait, wait a minute, You're, you can't check your car's gas tank from the wall? H how do you know how much gas is in it? You know, they're not gonna comprehend what it was like before every single object could talk to every single other object. 
And that's a giant transition that we're going through right now in the same way that electrification changed the whole world 100 years ago. So the simplest place to start thinking about this is uh, by looking at how uh, people's expectations and how users' expectations of network devices has shifted in the very recent past, say in the last 10 years. So before, say, 10 years ago, you know, 10 to 15, information processing and networking were very expensive. You know, uh, computers, ne ne necessarily, because you'd have one computer that would connect uh, to the network, or maybe even not. You know, you could afford one of those things. So necessarily, they had to be able to deal with every situation. They were very general purpose devices. They were really broad general purpose devices. And all the value in that computer was local. Essentially, everything was built into the thing that was sitting on your desk. And um, you know, if, if you lost that thing, you know, tragedy uh, uh, happened. You know, that one tool was designed to uh, deal with every situation. And that made it an interesting and really powerful tool, but a really kind of difficult and um, somet uh, sometimes challenging tool to use. What happened was is that um, the software then that ran on these things, you know, the stuff that's on the bottom, had to also be that same way, even when it was networked, like uh, I have Firefox down here, because the tools had to be completely generic and cover every imaginable use case. You know, uh, Microsoft Office had to cover every single thing you might ever want to do with uh, letters or numbers, you know, or uh, every kind of thing you might, every kind of situation you might encounter in doing any kind of work with letters or numbers. You know, that meant that you know you could do a whole lot of stuff with it, but it was a really um, a difficult situation to work with. You know, Office is just a bear. This is no longer the case. When computing fragmented, when it became really cheap to have a processing anywhere or everywhere, um, generic tools broke up into a whole wide range of specialized tools. And uh, centralized applications fragmented into a whole bunch of features. It's like you take every single button that's on every toolbar of Microsoft Word and you turn that into an app. And that's the world that we live in right now. The, it's a world where we don't no longer have one tool that we use for everything. We now have a toolbox of a bunch of different things that we have to kind of figure out how to do. Networking also had a huge change. Because what happened was, again, over the last 10 years, um, the web created a deep shift in people's expectations. You know, today, most, people's, uh, understand, most people understand that the experience that you see on one device is often actually part of something that's really far away. You know, that's connected to the world through this kind of digital back channel. In, and th what this means is there's no longer a need to pack all that functionality into it. And there's also no expectation that the functionality will be there because people expect it will be out on the, uh, in the cloud somewhere. And moreover, our expectation for the stability of an experience has completely changed. It used to be that if you closed your laptop, you had a pretty good... Um, you, uh, you had pretty good expectations that the next time you opened it, it would be exactly the same as you closed it. It's actually, that's actually completely untrue with network-based uh, services. Our expectation for the, way, the experience that we get from one moment to the next with a network-based uh, application, with a network-based device, have essentially shifted because our understanding of where the functionality is has shifted. It has shifted from the thing that's close to us to the, uh, the net. So we now have this very fluid understanding of what an application is. You know, if, uh, those of you who have uh, kind of been using kind of Google Docs for a while, you'll see they keep updating it. They keep updating that specific product. And if there was something that I did in that a year ago um, that I really liked or some way that it worked, I actually can't go back to that anymore. It's gone forever because there's no record of it on any device that I access it with. It is now completely, my understanding of it is it's completely this other thing. So um, our understanding of where the value 
of our experiences, of where the value of the things that we are doing has completely shifted. So if we take these shifts to their logical conclusion, what we see is that as information moves to the network, each individual device is actually no longer the only container of that information, the only, uh, the only container of the value. The information, the value that it creates, primarily lives online. So what happens is the devices become what I call service avatars. Uh, and a service avatar is essentially a thing that is a representation, a local representation of a remote service. And it's a conduit for the service. You know, you can take the avatar and give it to somebody else, but you're not giving them the service. You can take, uh, 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 you can change to a different device, but you're not actually changing the service. You can turn it off without turning off the service. None of that was true when we had laptops, when we had phones that uh, uh, you could turn off where the value was mostly local. So if we look at digital uh, photography as an example, we'll see that, um, and just take, let's, let's take Flickr, because I like Flickr a lot. We see that um, a camera becomes a really good tool for taking photos for Flickr. You know, we're getting, we're, uh, pretty soon we're going to have cameras that essentially have cell phones built into them so they can just automatically upload the photos. So it's essentially a cell phone with a big fancy lens on it. Um, and the way that you re uh, relate to it is not as, hey, it's a cell phone with a big fancy lens on it, or as a camera, but as a, uh, hey, I want to send these photos to Facebook. Hey, I'm taking a photo that I'm going to uh, put on this, uh, um, on Flickr. Hey. I'm uh, going to do something with this photo. You're, uh, you're using the camera to get at the service. A television becomes a really h good high resolution way of looking at your photos. A phone becomes a really uh, portable way of looking at your photos. Essentially, your relationship to each of the devices has changed because you're looking through the device to the service it represents. So, um, for example, YouTube. What we see with YouTube is that um, we're not actually going to YouTube. When you open up YouTube on your phone, you're not thinking in the way that you were thinking about going to a website before. Before, you were thinking about going to a website as a kind of place. Now, you're thinking about it as a kind of uh, window into YouTube. And that uh, relationship is how we're thinking about it, that we are always uh, are now looking through the devices to, um, uh, to the services that they represent. Um, and in fact, you know, we're, um, uh, we no longer think of the internet as a place you go, but as kind of the atmosphere. It's, a, it's something that is con always around you. And it's actually a surprise when it's not there. 10 years ago, it was a place you went. Now, it is the place you are. So, an example that I really like that's related to YouTube is Netflix. So you can get Netflix on virtually any device that has a screen and a network connection. You can pause Netflix you can, um, on one device, and you can unpause it on another device. Um, when we think about Netflix now, in the same way that we're thinking about YouTube, um, we're not thinking about it as, hey, I'm going to Netflix. We're thinking about it as like, hey, there's a hole in space right here. There's a good, nice rectangular hole in space for me to, uh, to uh, go to Netflix with. Our loyalty is not with the frame. Our loyalty is with the thing that's inside the frame. The frame is a short-term manifestation. And our loyalty is with the brand that's inside the frame. It's not the brand that's th that is on the frame. Our loyalty is the experience that's inside the frame. It's not the ex experience of the frame. The technology exists as a service, or the technology exists to enable the service, not as an end to itself. When we look at specialized hardware for Netflix, it primarily exists like Roku on the left. It only exists to give, you a, to give a, th a frame that doesn't already have Netflix access, Netflix access. It's really just kind of like this appendix. Um, and it turns any, uh, any device into a Netflix uh, frame, similar with the boxy box over there. So, you know, Amazon Kindle service is one of my favorite uh, uh, services like this. You know, here's a uh, great ad. I, I think they only ran this for a short while, but I grabbed it and I really like it. You know, essentially what this ad is saying is, you know, 
Use whatever avatar you want of the Kindle service. We actually don't care. As long as you stay lo loyal to the Kindle service, we're, gr we're cool with that. You know, uh, you know, just stay loyal to the Kindle service because that's really what matters to us. We don't care if you use our specialized device or, uh, or not. And with the Kindle Fire, that's exactly what Bezos is doing. If you look at what, uh, the way that he's talking about it, he is talking about it as a service. The device is an avatar of the service. It's a really different way of thinking about devices. It's completely different than the way that they presented the Kindle in, uh, uh, originally. Originally, the Kindle was a device you could read a book in, book on. Now, the Kindle is a service, an Amazon service, that you get a, uh, a specialized device for. So um, Facebook and HTC are going to be doing this thing called Buffy. Uh, I, I just grabbed, they've, they've actually done uh, several Facebook phones, and there are no images of Buffy. But uh, um, So uh, Facebook and HTC are doing a uh, ground-up design from kind of the hardware up of a Facebook phone. So you know, for a, a large number of people, Facebook is their primary, primary way of using the internet. So why not just make a Facebook phone? At least that's Facebook and HTC's thinking. So what they're doing is they're <laughs> going to make a device, you know, if, if it works out well, that is an avatar of Facebook. It is Facebook in a box. It is Facebook in a, in a little device. It probably, you, know, you can probably make calls with it, sure, whatever. But uh, 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 mostly what it does is it does Facebook. Um, my favorite example of this is actually this. And I've been using this example for a couple of years, so excuse me if you've heard this, this shtick before. Um, so this is the Vitality Glow Cap. You know, it's a wireless network connected pill bottle that's an avatar of Vitality's service. So Vitality's service, the goal of the service is to increase compliance with medical prescriptions, which is a huge uh, fi financial and uh, healthcare uh, problem. People don't comply. And I think, um, I think Chloe, somebody else talked about this. Um, uh, so the way it wor this works is that when you close a ca the cap, so there's two pieces to it right here. There's a, uh, you can see in the background, there's a, a little disc. That's actually a cell phone. And uh, it uh, plugs into an outlet. They don't, they don't tell the people who they give these to that it's a cell phone. They just say, you know, it's a nightlight. Plug it in like a nightlight. Yeah. And then the, uh, the other part is the cap. And so the cap talks to uh, the base. And every time you open the, uh, uh, the, uh, the cap and close it, uh, it does a couple of things. One of the things is that it resets the timer for when you next have to take your medicine. And when it's, it's time to take your medicine, it beeps, it, it turns colors, it reminds you. But that's the very first part. The other thing that it does is it sends a packet of data up to the service. And what the service does with it is really interesting. And there's a, a bunch of different things that it does with it, and I'm going to go through a couple of them. So one of the things that it does is it gives you a, um, a progress report of how well you've been doing. And it sends that by email. It can send it to you. It can send it to someone you love who can remind you to take better care of yourself. It can send it to uh, someone else. The other thing that it does is uh, it's kind of like a Google Analytics for uh, your own uh, medicine. The other thing that it does is it sends something that looks like a this to your doctor which, uh, on a regular basis, which is kind of your compliance uh, over a period of time. So your doctor can say, hey, you know, uh, you came in right after that big orange line when you didn't take your, your medicine for two weeks. Uh, and you came in and you were really sick. Okay, we now know why you were sick that day. We don't have to guess anymore. The doctor can say, oh, your compliance is, it's okay. You know, and uh, you, know, you, should, you can really uh, shape up. So um, what they have is, uh, this is from, uh, I don't know if you can read this, this is from uh, a PowerPoint that, that they did. So the, you know, they have, in the upper left-hand left -hand corner, they have uh, personal reminders, and then there's uh, social network support, which is what I talked about uh, in the upper right-hand corner. Lower right-hand corner is doctor accountability, and the, and the lower uh, left-hand corner is um, pharmacy coordination. What they mean by that is that when you, uh, when you run out of pills, you generally have the bottle open. And you know, you're like, uh-oh. I have the last thing. So what they did is they put a button on the bottom of the pill cap, and you push the button, and it automatically reorders uh, your medicine for you, and the medicine's automatically sent to your house. The combination of these things has increased compliance um, in their test uh, uh, in their test market. Uh, it's increased compliance for like 60% to like 98%. Um, every single person that uh, complies. To the, uh, to the medical prescription and does not go to the hospital, 
uh, saves uh, the insurance company tens of thousands of dollars. Um, the insurance company and the pharmacy are totally happy to pay $3 per bottle cap for this service. And um, uh, the service is, uh, I think, going to be launched nationally pretty, uh, pretty soon. It was just recently acquired. So um, what this service uh, uh, means to me, in addition to, I think, being a very uh, elegant service avatar system, is that um, what it shows is that when you, con when you track individual objects, like you know, pill bottle caps, and connect them to the internet, you can create this really profound change. Because like, that pill bottle cap is not doing a lot of data processing. You know, it's really just sending a tiny little bit of information, but it's creating a profound change when that's connected to uh, uh, a network. And, um, and what we can do is we can use what we've learned over the last 10 or 15 years in terms of moving little pieces of data on the internet to now affect the world outside the internet. So, for example, we have the technical ability to identify... Um, to uniquely identify and track um, virtually the, uh, every most disposable thing you can think of. of. For example, um, food. Um, this is a melon that is being uniquely tracked by a sticker uh, from a company called Yadamark. So, um, uh, and it's a real product, it's a real company. I've never actually been to a supermarket that has this, but uh, I know they exist. Um, uh, so what Yadamark's service does is it tracks each individual melon, and they, they don't j just do melons, they do other things too, um, uh, back from the farm that it was grown through every warehouse and truck that it's on uh, to the supermarket. So you can walk up to a melon and you can use it to make sure that it's fresh and you can track, its, uh, uh, track it back and get metadata information about it all the way back to the farm and make sure that the farm is actually an organic farm. You can check, uh, you can check on that to make sure that w the thing that you're getting is the thing that is, uh, is promised because the object tells you. So, um, moreover, once you know what kind of melon it is, you know, it's a sticker so you can like, scan it with your phone, once you know what kind of melon it is, you can automatically find out you know, things like you know, how to cook it, how to compost it, what recipes work with it, what your friends think about this kind of melon on Facebook. You know, in other words, you can actually do anything that you can do with anything else on the internet with a melon. Uh, <laughs> which is really interesting and powerful. So um, what I, this kind of sum total of information that is attached to this melon through this sticker, I call um, the information shadow of that object. So everything casts an information shadow. Virtually anything that's made uh, or any person or virtually any object, um, certainly, um, uh, things that are kind of familiar but we don't normally see, like uh, livestock, have huge information shadows. Uh, 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 like there are, there are RFIDs that sit inside the bellies of uh, um, goats. Like they'll feed a goat this thing that is, uh, uh, looks like a little heavy blob that's got an RFID in it. And as the goat walks around, you know, it sits in one of the goat's stomach. And as the goat walks around, it, uh, 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 T uh, it says where it is, you know, so you know, they don't have to actually read anything from the goat. The goat just like gets on a truck, the truck knows the goat's on the truck, that kind of thing. So livestock, hugely tracked. Huge information shadows, we have huge information shadows. Um, once that happens, once you can identify each individual object uh, uh, uniquely, you can start to make that individual object into a service avatar. And um, let me give you, like, that concept may be um, kind of wacky uh, in a lot of ways, especially after the goat example. Um, but um, let me tell you how this can work. Like, what can be done with this, uh, these kinds of technologies when they're put together? So um, I want to give you, uh, so this is, this is an example. So when you buy into a car sharing service. And in, um, in the Bay Area, we have a couple called City Car Share and Zipcar. And I looked up that there's one called Zazcar in Sao Paulo. Um, what you're doing uh, uh, when you subscribe to a car sharing service is um, you're joining a service. You're subscribing to a service. Um, each car then becomes a unique avatar of that service. 
because uh, uh, partially because each car uses uh, a bunch of technology. I mean, not that, that uh, not sophisticated technology like an RFID reader and a phone or a GPS to be actively connected to the service at all times. You know, you, uh, uh, you go on your phone and you say, you know, I want a car right now. It says there's a car three blocks away. Um, you say, okay, I want it for three hours. You uh, it says, great. You walk up to it, and if you don't have the right RFID, it won't let you open the car. It won't let you start the car. The car is com completely connected to the service. Because once you do re re register it and you do have the right thing, you just get in the car and drive away. You know, it may be a completely different car from the car you had before. It may be a completely different place than, the, 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 than where you, when you were before. And as you're doing that, the car is doing all of this uh, telemetry back to the service. It is um, talking about where you are, how long you've had it, you know, how much gas is in the gas tank, perhaps. Uh, all of that is completely transparent to you but it enables the service to exist. Those are all of the things that enable the, uh, the service to exist. From your perspective, you have this really interesting new relationship with an object. You know, we used to have essentially two kinds of cars. There used to be um, cars that you owned and cars that you rented. You had very different relationships with them. This now is a new kind of experience with an everyday object. You treat it very much like you treat your own car. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, you just get in it when you, uh, when you want it. Um, but it's not one car. It is a possibility space of cars. You get the kind of car that you want and that's available because like, for example, you know, sometimes you can get a sports car and if you uh, want, uh, need a pickup truck, you can get a pickup truck. Uh, sometimes they don't have the pickup truck and you only have the sport, you can only get the sports car, that kind of thing. But what you get is you have a possibility space of cars. Your relationship is not with a, uh, with a thing. Your relationship is with the possibility space of things that can fill that, um, that can uh, represent that thing. It is with the service. So uh, in Germany, they have a similar, and I, and I know they have these, these in Paris, and they've started to have these uh, elsewhere too. They have um, uh, this thing called the Call a Bike program. It's a bicycle rental program. Um, and it's run by the rail service. So when you need a bike, you find a bike. So these bikes are scattered throughout the city. They're generally uh, on uh, major street corners. They're just sitting there and they're locked up. And um, you walk up to the bike. It's got a phone number on it. You dial the phone number. It, it sends you back a code. You type the code into the bike. It unlocks the bike. You ride the bike. When you're done riding the bike, they ask you to leave it by a, a, a street corner, major street corner. You do that. You lock it up. And it charges you for how long you rode the bicycle by the minute. So uh, to your phone. So it's a service that you access through, uh, 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 through your phone that is the service of riding a bicycle. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mobility service. Um, you know, each bicycle becomes essentially an avatar of the service. You, know, you don't have a relationship with a specific bicycle. Your relationship is with the service. Your understanding of... Um, of how you use it is not based on your understanding of how to use a specific bicycle. It's with the service as a whole. So here's another example. This is a um, this is a uh, designer purse subscription service. It's called Bag Borrow or Steal. So um, you know you don't normally need an expensive purse or handbag all the time. Um, you need it for a weekend. Or you need it for a couple of days. Um, and you want to change them pretty often because you know fashions change. But they're really expensive. They're thousands of dollars. So um, what this service does is it lets you subscribe to the latest handbags. It lets you subscribe to the latest styles from the latest designers. And uh, what, you what you get is you essentially get a possibility space of the latest purse. You don't own anything but you always get to uh, get the benefit of this specific thing. And um, I think that's, a very, uh, that's very interesting. Here's another uh, company that uh, started up that kind of copies them. Um, it's called Rent the Runway. It does the same thing for uh, expensive designer dresses and costume jewelry. Again, expensive things you don't need to wear all the time. 
But what you want is you want the possibility of having the latest thing whenever you want it. And you don't want to ha have to pay the full price of always keeping up with that. This, these services are possible through network-based tracking of individual objects. In this case, you know, they, uh, uh, they uh, use uh, essentially FedEx to do that tracking. But each individual object is itself tracked. Um, I worked with a company in, um, in Italy that was essentially putting in uh, um, unique IDs into every high-end uh, into every high-end designer. We'll just say, you know, company that rhymes with Rada. Um, so uh, into every one of their products uh, that could identify its authenticity, and that feeds directly into services like this. And uh, I don't think these guys use it, but it, but it can. So they they know that the dress or the thing that you sent back is the thing that uh, they sent you in the first place. So my question is. How long until we can get a subscription to Zara or some other uh, kind of high iteration uh, uh, fashion oriented clothing service? How long until we can just have a subscription for our clothes? So instead of buying clothes, you just pay a monthly fee uh, for, a, uh, for a subscription and um, exchange your clothes for whatever's in season uh, at, the, at the seasonal changes. You know, we already have exactitudes. You know, people are fairly comfortable buying clothes that uh, are roughly in the same universe. You know, like these uh, gentlemen. You know, the, uh, the uh, you know they're all different, but they're all kind of the same. You know, people are already fairly comfortable with that concept. So why not actually make a service around it? Like, I don't want to look like exactly like one of those guys, but I kind of you know I, I like their style. You know, I kind of want to look like that. So. I think that this is a really powerful, um, uh, really deep change in the way that we're thinking about uh, objects and our relationship to, uh, to them. The problem is that this is all fairly new, and we don't have really good ways of thinking about how do we design interactions with these objects, whether they're literally digital or the, whether they relate to digital objects. Or you know, that um, I'm mostly thinking about things that are literally digital rather than kind of clothes uh, that uh, can have an RFID, which is kind of a uh, it's kind of digital. An RFID is a kind of the um, like the electronic equivalent of a virus, right? You know, <laughs> I guess not a digital virus, but a kind of a biological virus, which is kind of alive but kind of not alive. An RFID is kind of electronic and kind of not electronic. Um, anyway, so for me, the process of creating successful products is actually not um, limited to just kind of wrapping them in interesting interactions. For me, the, uh, the process of creating products um, is about understanding how to make them fit into uh, people's lives today and tomorrow. So when designing avatars, um, I think about a whole bunch of design disciplines at once. I think about a whole bunch of things that are happening all at the same time. You know, service design, industrial design, visual design, branding, uh, you know, all of these things are happening simultaneously with these kinds of products, with uh, uh, ubiquitous computing products and with service avatars. Um, since this is an interaction design conference, I really wanted to kind of uh, I think about the specific interaction design issues around this and um, to give you a feel for kind of what the kind of challenges are and kind of things that are interesting to me. So um, one of the... Um, the first chal uh, 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 challenge, and I experience this all the time with consumer electronics, is um, figuring out what an a, a given avatar, what a given thing will do and won't do. Because anything computational can kind of do anything these days. You can kind of like do, you know, you, you can kind of have this uh, interchangeability that is huge you know there's no reason why an android based connected tv can't run the whole android suite but there's a really good user experience reason why it shouldn't because the things that are designed for uh, 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 for a 50 centimeter user experience which is i guess about this or you know if it's a watch you know 20 centimeter user experience are not designed for a 3 meter user experience are not designed for you know, they, they, uh, in, in the Bay Area, they're called 10-foot UIs. So they're not designed for 10-foot UIs. Um, but application designers, people who are designing the things that, you know, the, essentially the service avatars that go into these frames, they're being asked to make things that are um, consistent across this really wide range of scales. 
Um, and it's really hard. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a nightmare out there. If you look at kind of the, the, the apps that are out there, it's a big nightmare. And part of that is because we just don't have, um, we haven't been doing this long enough for one, but we just don't have the uh, ways of measuring what's a successful user experience, of understanding what's a successful user experience. Um, and so for me, what I take from this is when you are designing something, maybe for a screen, but really when you're designing a service avatar in general, the uh, key challenge is not figuring out what to do, but what's not, but what not to do. What, is, what does not work in the form factor that you're working with? What does not work in the uh, context that you're designing for? What does not work uh, uh, in the uh, user base that's going to be using your thing? Let me um, actually uh, go to this example, which we've brought up before. Um, um, so uh, this is a slightly different thing because we're not talking necessarily about apps. We're talking about specifically designing a product. For me, again, you know, the difference between designing for a screen and designing a product, you know, it's, it's a pretty big difference, but there's a you know, slipperiness between them because the, the products can do, like each product can do what the other one can do to some extent. Um, so as Chloe talked about yesterday, consumer electronics companies essentially add the equivalent of a tablet PC to a refrigerator um, because it's technically easy. They, they, uh, you know, they don't say no to that. The problem is that they don't actually think through how this computer is going to make the refrigerator a better refrigerator. <laughs> you know, not like how you can make a computer and a, put a computer in a different place, but how you can you make a refrigerator a better refrigerator. So if we think in terms of um, kind of network devices, we essentially um, uh, then ask the question of like, okay, what is the service avatar that this is a um, uh, that this refrigerator uh, is of? What is the service that this refrigerator is a avatar for? Um, and uh, when Chloe was presenting her idea, she was actually absolutely correct in focusing on having the refrigerator know what food is in it. So you know, it can become the avatar of her favorite online grocery uh, service. Uh, the key insight, again, is not what can the computer do. The key insight is what does the fridge do? So the key insight is not the computer, the fact that you can do anything which is true. The key insight is what is the specific context that you're designing for and how do you say no to every single thing apart from that. Um, and as we've seen, you know, no consumer electronics companies actually managed to do this. So when I was writing this slide today, when I was rewriting this slide this afternoon, um, you know, I've been thinking about this for a long time. You know, there's an entire chapter in my book devoted to this. And I've been thinking about the refrigerator, the smart fridge problem for a long time. Um, I actually realized th that I had an insight. And I don't know if Chloe's here, but I, w I wanted to uh, share it. So I had an insight. Well, awesome. Okay, so here's my insight. So there is actually a model that we can follow that uh, uh, will possibly make a smart refrigerator work. And um, do you know what that model is? It's the mini bar. So a uh, hotel mini bars are actually, <laughs> are actually refrigerators. And they have these automatic systems for, uh, for figuring out whether you have taken the Jack Daniels or the condom. <laughs> or perhaps both. <laughs> and if no one else has checked into your room, they will ask why. Uh, <laughs> But the, the point is that they have these systems. And, if, and Chloe, if you and I can figure out how to uh, scale this up so that uh, uh, it works in people's homes, we've got an awesome business ahead of us. So let's talk after. <laughs> so um, I think Mike uh, talked about this earlier. Actually, I heard about this because I was uh, busy writing that slide. Um, but uh, this is the Nest thermometer. So the Nest thermometer, uh, uh, Mike probably explains, is a smart home thermometer that's an avatar of their online service. Um, so the, the, uh, a tangential, I don't know if you mentioned this, a tangential interesting backstory is that uh, the team that created this is the team that's, th uh, that, um, or like a good chunk of the team that created the iPod for Apple. They started a company back in the uh, late 90s that uh, Apple bought and uh, uh, turned into the iPod. They then uh, all quit Apple and they started Nest. 
So this is roughly the same people that started the iPod. Um, and uh, what's interesting about the Nest thermometer is that um, it's an avatar of their service. So yeah, it's actually, you know, it's a computer. There's a totally computer in there. I didn't actually put up a slide in there. Like th they actually have like really like fairly high resolution graphics that they can display in that, uh, in that round uh, display. They, they, they don't. Um, and you know, it's computationally probably about the equivalent of an iPod Nano. But what, they, what they're not trying to do is they're not trying to make another random small computer that's kind of stuck to your wall. You know, instead, they're making a thermostat. You know, that's all it does. It doesn't do anything except to try to be the best kind of thermostat they possibly can, to be able to save energy using its connection to the net as the way that it figures out how to help you be comfortable and maximally save energy. And they could have made it as an, an invisible box. They could have just replaced it with like a, a, a white box that you hang on your wall or, or stick in, in a closet and they you can you know, control through some kind of remote Android app. But they didn't because what they wanted to do is they wanted to make a thing that looks like a thermostat that lives where a thermostat lives but works completely differently. You know, this is a transitional um, th this, is, this is a transitional form between the thermostats that we are familiar with and whatever the next thermostat-like thing that we're going to have 10 years from now is. Because this one still looks like a thermostat. Um, and since, this, since they're good service designers and they think about this, um, it's of course not the only avatar. It's not the only thing that you do. It's not the only thing that you design to connect to this service. And they also have other avatars, and each one is focused on maximizing the value that's possible within the context of the device that it is running in. So, you know, what's good about a high-resolution computer screen? You know, you know that, that thermostat doesn't have a very high-resolution screen on, on purpose. But <coughs> what's good about it? Well, you can use the large screen to see a complex schedule, to be able to set a fairly complex schedule. That's what you, th you see, kind of see on the bottom there. And that's what uh, they do, that's what you can do with, a, uh, with the online avatar that you can't do with the um, uh, in-place avatar with the, uh, with the actual thermostat. Um, what they did is they um, used the affordances, they used the capabilities of what was available on each of the devices that they were designing for to um, maximize the utility of that device as it relates to this uh, service. You know, and that actually sounds like a pretty straightforward user-centered design. Um, but it's actually surprisingly confusing. And you see a surprising amount of uh, uh, products that when they do this kind of service design, they essentially just copy one thing to another. Like, oh, we need to have complete consistency between this. And um, I, I don't think they did this because I haven't actually played with the real thing, but like the, the way um, of not the kind of wrong way of doing this would be essentially to say, okay, that's what the thermostat looks like. On the app, you're going to get a round thing that looks exactly like that, that you use uh, remotely. But what's the point in that? You're not really, you, like, th you know, people are smart enough that they don't need that kind of slavish one-to-one -one consistency. What they need is they need to have the thing make sense in the context in which they're using, using the device that, uh, that makes sense to them. So a second key interaction design challenge with these things, with connected devices and with really smart devices in general, is how to manage um, their behavior. So when you had an, kind of an unconnected computer uh, on your desk, you know, like I said, you were pretty sure you knew what, what that thing was doing. You know, um, but the more you know, you knew that uh, uh, when you closed it or, you know, when you s shifted from one window to another, you pretty much knew what the thing was doing in front of you. you. You had a pretty good way of anticipating that. The more connected a device, the more it does things without asking you, um, without you knowing, because the service is the thing that's doing, not the device. So designing interactions with devices that have their own behaviors especially ones that connect to services, is actually qu quickly becoming a really significant inter interaction design challenge. So let me give you a, a very simple example. It's actually not a connected device, but I really like this example. So this is the water pebble. Um, so it's a shower timer. It's about this big. It's about, uh, about like that. 
It's a shower timer um, uh, whose goal is to reduce water usage. So the way it works is that the first time you use it, you push a, uh, first time you take a shower, you push a, bu uh, a button on it. it uh, it's got three lights on it, a uh, uh, red light, a green light, and a yellow light. The three lights blink. You throw it into the drain, like next to the drain like this. You know, it kind of sits there. It's got a little um, silicone bottom so it doesn't slide around, so you don't kill yourself if you stand on it. And, uh, um, and what it does is the first time you use it, it just times your shower. The next time you use it, you just put it down there and it senses uh, that it's wet. So it just immediately goes on. And, it's, and it starts green and then it goes to yellow and then eventually it goes to red and then it eventually goes to blinking red. Um, and um, what it's doing is essentially timing your shower. So, you know, okay, great. It's blinking red. I've reached the end of my shower. Great. I'm going to get out. I'm done. Um, the interesting, clever, algorithmic part of it is that um, it will slowly reduce the amount of time that it gives you over time. So that it's designed to teach you to uh, use less water, to give you feedback that will help you use less water. So let me give you my personal experience with it. I actually have one of these. Um, the problem with it, and I, and I use it for a while, the, the, the problem with it is, is that its algorithm for behavior change does not match my ability to change. So um, what happened was is that I was using it and I was reducing the amount of time, uh, uh, the, the amount of time uh, uh, over, uh, over time. And then eventually um, I couldn't reduce it anymore and it was blinking red all the time. You know, I was like, oh, God damn it. And, uh, and so what happened was is that instead of helping me change my behavior, it just made me feel guilty every single day. <laughs> so I stopped using it pretty, uh, uh, pretty quickly. Um, my point is, is that uh, if this was a network thing, I would need to have an interface with which to be able to communicate with us, with which to be able to have a dialogue with the algorithm that is making decisions for me. And so many of the things that we are getting now are making a lot of decisions for us and we don't have a very good way to interact with those things, to have a very good understanding of how do you interact with the uh, uh, algorithms to help them match, you, uh, match what you want. You because know, I bought this because I wanted to save water. I didn't buy this because I wanted to feel guilty. Um, and it gives me nothing. You know, it's well-intentioned, but it gives me nothing. So you can see some of this. You know, I have, you know, the, uh, iRobot, which is the, uh, the Roomba. Um, you know, they, um, what, what, what they did is they did a kind of a combination of things for how, to, you know, how do you negotiate with, with your device. So initially they just had four buttons. One of them was off and the other, and the other, uh, the other three uh, represent what they called missions. And each mission is essentially a um, uh, pre-programmed sequence of things that the Roomba will do. It's a, it's a vacuum cleaner, so, you know, there's one that's for spot cleaning, that's one that's uh, kind of general cleaning, and there's one for kind of ma uh, maximum cleaning. And they did a lot of research about like, okay, you know, theoretically this robot could do anything. You could, you know, hook up a laptop to it and, you know, give it all kinds of parameters. You could set all kinds of things. You could set, but what, uh, what they did is they did a lot of research to figure out, okay, what's the kind of the minimum set? What do we, how do we say no to all the possibilities and just leave what is the thing that people need? And how do we, uh, how do we make that, uh, that one thing that is really important the thing that, uh, or in this case, a couple of things, the, the things that our device does. And that negotiation, that understanding based on, a context, based on understanding context becomes a critical part of this kind of interaction design. So iRobot continued to do research and they actually ended up going, uh, getting down to one button. It's uh, essentially one and a half buttons. There's, there's, there's a, bu a little button on, uh, on top. Um, so, the next interaction design challenge, for, from my perspective, is um, how do you deal with interactions with data streams rather than data files? And traditional computer, uh, computer devices produce files. And over the last 30 years, we've actually developed you know, eh, imperfect but okay mechanisms for dealing with files. You know, today, like if you use the Mac, you know, the, the, 
you end up using the Mac, or at least I end up using the Mac more as a search engine than I do as a, you know, using the finders to, to find files. And you know, it's not a great service, but it, but it works. You know, we have some idea of how to conceptualize and work with files. The problem is, is that service avatars, because they are autonomous network devices, um, do not produce files. Instead, what they do is they, their basic unit of data is the stream, is the data stream. Every one of these services, every one of these things that I've been showing, well, I guess except for, I guess, the Roomba, produces a continuous stream of information rather than single units of information. And this is a huge change. This is a change uh, that's akin to the change that happened uh, kind of in my experience with the web when we went from making static pages to dynamically generated sites. You have to think about things completely differently because you are now working with a completely different set of uh, constraints and criteria. Um, so the bottom uh, is Patch Bay. It's a map from Patch Bay, which is an um, online data brokerage for you know, roughly what I would call uh, service avatars. So um, they have roughly 80,000 different data streams that are producing uh, continuous real-time uh, streams of data. How do you manage that? How do, you ma how, do you, uh, how do you create interactions that are meaningful in terms of those data streams and be able to use them and manage them? What do you do? So my theory is that you look at the financial industry because uh, money is actually one of our oldest services. It's one of our oldest data streaming services. Um, and there's lots of you know, really well-known service avatars for money, credit cards, ATMs, uh, banks. You know, and there's a lot of good services out there that have very good interactions with streams of money. You know, uh, Mint.com has been mentioned at least once here. This is uh, an example for Mint. Uh, uh, Mint, uh, Mint really did this fantastic job at understanding how people wanted to think of money because uh, you know, the, the problem that Mint is solving is, is that uh, they you typically have you know, 30 different sources of uh, uh, kind of um, money going in and out and you want to figure out where does it go and wh why can it and it's really hard to do that. What Mint did is they rolled all of that up into graphs like this and things that you could drill down and understand more but also things that consolidate information and help you deal with the streams of information. So, you know, how would this work? And I, I don't have an answer to this. But I'm ju I just want to pose it as a question. How would this work with um, multiple video subscriptions? Say you have 20 streaming video subscriptions, each of which is giving you somewhat overlapping and somewhat related and somewhat contextually uh, appropriate but maybe not, not entirely um, uh, recommendations for uh, uh, things to watch simultaneously. How do you merge that? How do you think about doing that? I think that the answer is to um, look at the way that people deal with money and look at, this, uh, look at the way that uh, uh, sites like Mint, but also other financial sites, deal w uh, uh, with money. Uh, and you know, maybe, maybe there's something there, maybe, maybe, there, maybe there isn't. Um, but I think that's our, that's our currently best model for thinking about this really kind of big problem. So the last major interaction problem um, that I want to talk about is that um, while all of these devices can kind of technologically work well together, they're all actually separate. You know, and uh, I, I don't know if, if, if um, you've ever had this kind of frustration about the fact that you have one digital device, you have a second digital device, you want to get information from this to this, and you have this like really frustration. It's like, look, the data, it's only, you know, this far apart. I, want, I just want the data from here to there, you know. Can I just rub them together and, uh, uh, and make the data fall in there? You know, and you have this like, I know that they're technically capable of uh, working together, and I really want to have this unified experience uh, among all of the devices that I have, but how do I do that? We don't have very good ways of doing that. We have, um, um, in fact, no good ways <laughs> of doing that. Um, but we're starting to make some headway, and I wanted to uh, show you this and ta talk about this a little bit. So um, um, right now in consumer electronics, you're starting to see what, uh, a lot of design around what's called second screen interfaces for watching TV. And um, what that means is that uh, the current philosophy, the current belief among uh, consumer electronics companies and content companies um, is that people uh, 
uh, watch TV and have a tablet on their lap at the same time. And uh, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could uh, do things with the both of those? So this, um, I don't know if that's true. I think there's some truth to it. Um, but uh, they're, uh, they're putting some energy behind it. And this is one of the things that came out of that uh, that I think is most interesting. So this is uh, the Tron Legacy, the, the film Tron, the, uh, the Tron Legacy uh, Blu-ray has a companion app. And you run the app on your, uh, on your iPad or, uh, or your iPhone. Uh, and what it does is it listens to the soundtrack because they couldn't figure out a better way to make the networks, uh, the networks communicate, so they just have it listen. So it listens to the soundtrack, and uh, it synchronizes what's on the tablet with what's going on on screen. So you can do things like, uh, hey, there's a light cycle. Ooh, I want to get a 3D view of a light cycle and, and explore it. You know, hey, there's a character. Hey, wh where else did I see that character? Hey, there's this other stuff. And so what they're doing is they're creating this two-screen experience, you know, a way to experience the same content through two different facets, theoretically using kind of contextually appropriate um, interactions. I think this is actually pretty interesting. Uh, I think it's not surprising that Disney is doing this. They are actually the best people that are out there in terms of understanding how to uh, create experiences that transcend multiple media. Um, they they do all kinds of really fant uh, fantastic work in terms of uh, you know creating cartoons and toys and uh, theme park experiences and movies and all of these things and essentially having each of those things be a small window into a larger world that you uh, uh, that you un uh, understand but itself being uh, tuned to the medium that it, uh, that it's in. Um. You may not like the content, but the way they present it is fantastic. So the last thing I want to talk about is actually kind of a kind of biggish idea. It's actually the most speculative. Maybe it's not even a big idea, but it's most speculative. So I want to talk about the shape of avatars. So shape, as I started out, is a key component of the user experience. And I'm really interested in the way that physical shapes of objects change when new technologies uh, are applied. And I think we're actually about to see a big shift in that. So um, let me start with telephones, so old telephones. So the old telephone network was actually the, the first uh, widespread avatar service, avatar-based service. You know, these phones were not owned, at least in America, they were not owned by the person who used them, they were owned by the phone company. So they were really a, literally a very clear avatar. And if you look at an old phone, it's, it, it, you actually see this interesting set of design decisions they made. You know, it's not built for fashion, it's not built for flexibility, it's built for the most common use case. And it's not built for annual replacement, it's built for repair. It's very simple, it's very modular, and the internal parts uh, didn't change for decades. Like they changed the colors, but the internals didn't change for decades. It's very, very conservative product design. Incredibly conservative product design. The minute that phones stopped being avatars, the minute that they started being things that you bought, they fundamentally changed and their shapes went crazy. Their shapes went crazy and the features went gimmicky. Um, because the set of incentives for creating this completely changed. The set of incentives was very different. You know, the, you're incentivized to buy a new phone on a regular basis. And you know, uh, buy, and, and, and they would compete on things like the fact, I don't know if you, you probably can't see it, that, um, uh, Garfield's eyes open when you um, pull the handset up. <laughs> that was the killer app. <laughs> so uh, that's that's from 1989, by the way. That's like kind of at the peak of crazy phone stuff before cell phones kind of started appearing. Um, so as we move into a world of more service avatars, we can actually see this pattern repeating itself. So municipal service avatars, which are kind of the familiar Internet of Things things, such as smart electricity meters and networked parking meters, um, are actually very conservative for the exact same reasons that the original phones are, those, those phones. And that's actually not that surprising. What is surprising is that so is the call-a-bike bicycle. So the call-a-bike bicycle actually had many of the same design constraints which are inherently imposed based on the economics of the, of the plan. And they made the same kinds of decisions. So the call bike bikes um, are actually different than any other bike in the world, you know, for reasons of kind of not having people steal them. They made every single part on them not fit any other bicycle anywhere in the world. 
So uh, they had to redesign them from scratch. But they also designed them so that they, so that you can you know, kick one of these and it's not going to put a dent into it. You can throw it off the back of a truck and it'll be fine. It's very, very robust design. It's very easily repaired. It's also incredibly conservative. Odds are is that this bicycle will look exactly like this 20 years from now. They'll probably have changed the electronics on it, but the, uh, uh, but the metal parts will look exactly like this. So what does this mean for service design? So does that mean that service design has to be ultra conservative? Well, no. You can go the other route. You can go the other way. Um, so before the advent of LCD TVs, the replacement cycle of a CRT TV, of a traditional tube TV, was 15 years, somewhere between 10 and 15 years. Today, um, you can see that the prices, this is just a, a graph of 55-inch TVs, the price of LCDs drops on the order of 20% per year. Um, it, 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 it drops incredibly fast. So people are replacing their TVs much quickly, and much more quickly, and, people are th and the companies are totally encouraging this. Um, so what this does is this affects how they design the TVs. You know, the, as the prices fall, the pr profit margins fall, and uh, the quality starts going down. So Vizio, which is a low-end TV maker in the US, it's actually pretty successful, but it's a low-end, now tells people that they must replace their TVs if they're older than 12 months old. So um, what that means is they're essentially saying that instead of a 15-year replacement cycle, Vizio is uh, working on a 12-month replacement cycle for televisions. So, in other words, like the Garfield phone, uh, when the economics change, the design decisions also change. And when you're just buying a frame, the design decisions are also changing. And, um, you know, frankly, neither of these options is very appealing to me. You know, either get very conservative design or you get very disposable design. You know, if that's, a, that's, that's a kind of a bad choice. You know, imagine the, the Zara clothing thing that I presented earlier. You know, you'd, uh, your, your choice would either be the kind of clothing that um, uh, garbage men uh, uh, wear, because, you know, that stuff never breaks, or it would be made of paper. You know, uh, that, that just doesn't work for me. Um, I think that um, the answer is, and this is a very broad sense, the answer is for us as designers, this is why I was talking about entre entrepreneurship here earlier, to reinvent the business models in light of this, to understand that these are the conditions that we're working under, that these are the devices that we're working with. We are the interaction designers. We are the people that understand this the best. We have to redesign the business models. We understand how to make tools that satisfies people's desires for self-expression, uh, give people a way to be elegant, that give them uh, a variety of things, and uh, given the functionality they're interested in. And we also understand how to make things that will last. So, um, what we're entering with this is, um, and I don't have a great answer for how we should reinvent those business models. I'm thinking about it. We're working on it. There's more companies to be started. Um, we're at the beginning of a profoundly new world, where the emerging technologies in our world are, re, uh, are fundamentally reshaping um, our environments. They're reshaping our relationships to objects. They're reshaping the objects that we have. Because we're, the interaction designers, we're going to be the ones who are going to be designing that. And, and with that, you know, much like John said, we have a great responsibility. Because we are the ones who grew up with the net. We're most familiar with it. We're mo the, most, the ones who are the most familiar with the, um, uh, uh, how to make it and how uh, people's relationships are. Not the roboticists, not the network engineers. Um, because of this, it is our responsibility to use our knowledge of people and to use our knowledge of technology to start new companies, to take really big risks, to be really thoughtful about uh, the implications of what's uh, going to happen next without ever understanding, without with that, uh, sorry, with the, the understanding that we actually have no idea what the effects of what we're doing are. So with that, thank you.